years ago, the island of Britain was in turmoil. The people of Wales had taken up arms to try to shake off the rule of the English. They'd done so at the urging of one man. His name? Owain Glyndwr. The revolt led by Owain Glyndwr almost brought the mighty English state crashing to the ground. No other figure in British history, not even the famous Scot, William Wallace, or Braveheart, did more to undermine the integration that led, eventually, to the United Kingdom. And yet, outside Wales, Owain Glyndwr isn't very well known, and even within his own country, he's often seen as a kind of Robin Hood figure. Well, our aim in this programme is to put that right. Many of the Welsh think of Glyndwr as a legendary figure whose spirit lives on. But who was he? And how did he end his days? Many of us are equally intrigued by the secret plans that he and his allies drew up. What exactly did those plans contain? And what impact would they have had on Britain if they'd worked? We're in search of answers to all of these questions. We'll be exploring the mysteries about Glyndwr the man, and we'll be asking why he did what he did. Why did Glyndwr embroil the Welsh in a long and bloody war against the English? Why did he wait until he was in his 40s before embarking on his crusade? And why did that rebellion fail? The answers should help us understand a key figure, not just in the history of Wales, but in the history of Britain. The last native-born Welshman to bear the title Prince of Wales. Our journey in search of Owain Glyndwr must start here, in the Dee Valley in northeast Wales, because it's there in the little village of Glyndwrdwy that he's thought to have been born around the year 1354. The name by which he's known is in fact a shortened form of Owain Glyndwrdwy, which means Owain of the Glen of the Water of the Dee. The people who live around here are understandably keen to claim Glyndwr as one of their own. But he's thought to have spent rather more of his time on another of his estates, one that lies some 20 miles south of here, near the border between England and Wales. This beautiful valley was once dominated by a grand manor house owned by Glyndwr. It was called Sacharth but the house was destroyed by Glyndwr's enemies at the height of his revolt. All that remains today, sadly, is the mound on which it once stood. But thanks to a certain poet, we know just what the house looked like and what went on there. Now, the poet in question was Yolo Goch, or Red Yolo, who was a frequent visitor here to Sacharth and wrote at length about the house and the grounds. And he describes for us the little church nearby and the deer park and the vineyard, and the water mill, and a huge fish pond, which, by the way, is still tucked away there in the trees, even today. Now, as for the house, well, by all accounts, that was pretty impressive, because it had a tiled roof, lots of bedrooms, and, as Yolo says in some wonder, several chimneys to convey the smoke away, which was quite a thing in those days. But what impressed Yolo most of all was the lavish hospitality, which was always on offer in the house of Owain Glyndwr, and which, of course, inspired some of Yolo's best poetry. Hunger, thirst, want and reproach are never known in Sacharth, so said Yolo Goch making it clear that he'd spent many hours in what he called this baron's palace, this mansion of generosity. And he left his readers in no doubt about who deserved the credit for all this luxury, who deserved the thanks for all this culture, who else but Owain Glyndwr. Here was a man for whom Yolo had nothing but praise. He went on, 
A tall, handsome, accomplished gentleman owns this place. Hardy and valiant, the best of Britons. Let's be clear, medieval bards were expected to flatter their patrons, otherwise they wouldn't get a lot of work. But Yolo's praise for Owain is remarkably warm and sincere. And there's a very special reason for that, I think. In English eyes, Owain wasn't particularly important or wealthy or powerful. But in Welsh eyes, his status was altogether different. What made Lindur vitally important to his fellow Welshmen was the quality of his ancestry. Until 70 years or so before his birth, Wales had been ruled by a number of native princes, and Lindur was related to almost all of them. He was descended from the princely house of Northern Powys, Powys Vadog. His bards claimed also that he was connected to the princely house of Gwynedd and again to the princely house of Dehaibas through his mother. So in a sense he did combine the various princely houses of Wales uh, in his blood. In the years before Glyndwr's rebellion, many people in Wales were desperately hoping that he'd make use of his ancestry to try to seize control of the country. They longed for this to happen because of the deep resentment they felt about England's occupation of their land for a century. Edward I of England had conquered Wales at the cost of many lives in the year 1282. He'd cemented his victory by creating a so-called iron ring of castles around the country and then supplemented this by building a network of fortified towns. By Glyndwr's day, these towns, Conwy is a good example, had become English outposts within Wales. They were walled communities, dominated by English settlers who treated their Welsh neighbours with contempt. The bards had long predicted the coming of a national saviour, a Mab Darogan, as we say in Welsh, who would free the people from this foreign rule. And they hinted heavily that Owain Glyndwr was the man they had in mind. But this will surprise many people. Owain Glyndwr wasn't very enthusiastic. <laughs> 